So guys, you heard the introduction, the internet of everything, the internet of things. Is, is this a real thing? Is it going to happen? And if it is going to happen, what are the devices? What, what, are, what is our life going to be like? What are the internet of things? What are the things going to be? I wonder, Rod, just because you're furthest away, so you've got least chance of hitting me for giving, <laughs> you, giving you the first and hardest question, would you like to kick off? Sure. Look, um, the answer to the first question is already here, I think. Um, and if you're asking uh, devices, I, I think the key thing is everything eventually will be connected. It's probably the simplest way to think about it. Whether, um, you're talking about the internet of things. I think the big thing is the mobile internet. You know, we started with the internet, and then it was... Uh, mobilized and then you've got all the smart devices connecting that and the advent of apps and cloud it's sort of it just you know you've got a um, you know a log curve effect going on at the moment you know so things are taking off exponentially is uh, exploding would be the word I'd use don't use that word too close to Dave sitting next to you because he's just in the go live stage of an ERP implementation today <laughs> and he's uh, got to build me a platform too so. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about things exploding gets them slightly nervous uh, at the moment um, but if I could come perhaps to this end, Jeff, sure. um, your view on, on devices, what people will be using, uh, is it going to happen and what will people be doing? From Cisco's perspective, you guys study this constantly, <laughs> I think, don't you? Cool. Listen, I, I agree completely with Rod. I think this has moved on from being a prediction to being um, uh, a near-term certainty for how our industry is going to evolve. Uh, doesn't need any major technology innovations or breakthroughs in order to happen, all of the core capability that we need to enable the internet of everything is pretty much in place. Um, and looking at it, uh, if you, your aspiration is to connect up everything, right at the moment only about one-fifth of one percent of things that could conceptually be connected to the internet to enable some form of economic value are currently done. So that's why you see these um, very significant uh, growth projections and, and trajectories for a number of devices. and. Currently, the consensus is that we'll have, by 2020, about 50 billion devices connected to the internet, up from about 10 billion today. And for most people here, that kind of time horizon is well within the planning horizon that people look at uh, in their business and are thinking about the technology platforms they need. So this is something that is um, immediate and real right now for how people are thinking about their business. Mm. It's real right now. Did you say from now to 2020, 10 billion to 50 billion? Correct. Wow. Yeah, it was the big general consensus estimate. Wow, that's huge, isn't it? Yep. Uh, Dave, I'm wondering, um, from your point of view, changing the world, uh, what's the impact of going from 10 to 50? I, I know you've got some international experience. What sort of things have you seen in this particular space? Well, it's quite interesting. So for us, I mean, what we're seeing is the massive growth of storage off the back of this as well. So, so once you start getting into devices being connected, all the information's got to be stored somewhere. And uh, a lot of people are finding different ways of actually using, uh, using that storage or using that information. Uh, the industry calls it big data, which sits out there with a lot of other things. And uh, that's great for us, obviously, being in uh, distribution and selling a lot of storage equipment and networking equipment. But uh, one of the things which struck me uh, recently is I have spent a bit of time offshore just looking at how New Zealand businesses are trading overseas. And when you get into some of the retail sectors, uh, I was fortunate enough to spend a bit of time in China. And over there at the moment, they're actually trialling virtual supermarket shelves, for example, where if you walk into the subway, they've got a shelf sitting there where people hold their smart devices up, scan what they'd like, and because of the long travel time and the incredible efficiency around some of the logistics over there, by the time you get home, your meal's actually sitting there at your front door ready to be cooked. Uh, through to, you know, the US we're seeing virtual pop-up stores now, uh, where if you're at a certain place at a certain time and you put your phone up to basically thin air, a shop pops up, you can buy a certain type of, uh, Airwalk trial it actually with shoes, certain type of shoe, uh, and, you know, all that analytics gets stored somewhere, so it's, uh, it's pretty exciting times. Mm. I could perhaps frame it up a bit better. Cisco's actually completed a... Um, a white paper around this to try and understand and quantify the economic impact that might um, happen around the, if the internet of everything plays out as we anticipate. Uh, and they looked at 21 use cases in various industries. So this is the, the smart grid across agriculture, the transportation network and that. And the assessed value across just those 21 areas over the next 10 years uh, was about $14.4 trillion of um, uh, additional economic value created by embracing the concepts of the Internet of Everything. And 
we don't have time to go through all the mechanics of that, but even if that's, say, 50% wrong, the conclusion is still the same, right? This is a very, very significant thing, and, and I guess the conclusion is that how much organisations uh, understand and embrace this concept is going to be one of the determinants of um, how successful they are commercially uh, over the next 10 years or so. It's a big number. A big number. Sign uh, suggests significant opportunity. David, from Microsoft's point of view, what's your perspective on the answers that the panel have given to the question so far? Who do you agree with and who do you disagree <laughs> with? Uh, it's pretty, pretty hard to disagree with the trends that we're seeing in the market around Internet of Everything. And, um, our CEO Satya talks about being uh, in a mobile first, cloud first world, and that really is embedded in this, this internet of everything concept. Um, the, only, the only thing I think that still the verdict's out on a little bit is how that actually plays out. Right today, we're incredibly focused on devices. That's kind of where we come from. That's what everyone got excited about with, um, I guess, when Apple bought their, their first kind of iTunes player type device out, that kind of galvanized the market around what's all about device. And so when, when I kind of look forward at the Internet of Everything, I, I kind of wonder whether it's going to continue to always be about the device or whether it becomes more about the sensors that those devices interact with and the cloud that then enables those sensors and devices to deliver a true value to whatever that person's trying to experience. Mm. And I think uh, Microsoft is investing a, a lot. Um, four or five years ago, we really took our business and said, hey, it's got to go cloud first. And so we've, we've been working hard on that cloud strategy so that we can enable the experiences depending on whatever device uh, becomes the winner on the day. Interesting. So you're setting up the infrastructure or the enabling technologies to, um, to make whichever way it goes. Predicting the future can be quite difficult, but you want to be in yep. a position to... And Liz, from your point of view, uh, from what you've heard so far, do you, uh, do you want to take the challenge of agreeing or disagreeing with the... I'll agree and disagree with various speakers, but I think the key thing is that everyone's got a valuable point, and that is that it's not just about acknowledging the fact that the reality of device explosion is creating an opportunity, it also creates a problem. So the opportunity I agree with in the sense that it's growing and it generates GDP, absolutely. But the, the threat is of a security problem, potentially organisations who aren't addressing security with that pervasive spread of devices um, are exposing themselves to some risk. So it's important to make sure that you understand and contain the security perimeter properly. And HP, through our acquisition of ArcSight, did exactly that by having very high performance analytics. The other thing is the actionable insight that can be gained from the explosion of data generated by this um, expansion of devices. Um, in one case, um, the instrumentation of the Earth in the sense that um, seismic and analytics related to pred predict, uh, prediction of earthquakes on one part of the US uh, to the other end where, in places like Bangladesh, the telcos in an area which is known to be poor and the average revenue per user is something like two US dollars per month, they're mobile phone heavy. Even the poorest rickshaw driver has a mobile phone and conducts e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge for the government there is to make sure that they actually track and monitor the payments mm -hmm. so that there's no fraud opportunities. Mm -hmm. In India, the government is trying to increase the banking coverage from about 20% to 50% over the next five years because it's a huge underground cash economy. Mm. So there's a lot of social policy implications, and that goes into the healthcare perspective as well, gathering insight from all of this data in an appropriate way, because quite often people are concerned about privacy, and I know we all talk about privacy, but there's a social good in being able to shape those barriers properly. Mm. And that's where a lot of the research is going on, particularly within HP, in our HP labs, to be able to gain broader insight across the whole ecosystem and provide to one side, the social media platforms like Facebook who use our high-performance database Vertica, and for others to say, here's the social good where we're investing in social ventures. Mm. Interesting. So, so there, are risks, there are risks around security. There are risks around privacy. Uh, there are opportunities as well, and perhaps we'll come to the opportunities in a minute. Um, but just staying on risks, an opening to the panel to, to volunteer who would like to speak to this. Um, our audience today are involved in businesses, they're involved in IT or in other business functions, and the future has got um, enormous opportunities for obviously, but in terms of managing the risks and the pitfalls, what are the kind of things that you think we ought to be either now watching out for or preparing for as, as, uh, as time is passing in our planning now? Anybody like to talk about risks and pitfalls? Uh, Sorry, it's a negative subject. Who wants to talk about the negative? I think, I think oh. the points are all, they're all the points that uh, Liz just made. They're around security 
um, you know, protecting data, fraud, all of those things. And the interesting thing will be, um, you've got this whole thing going on with the, you know, the millennials, and as they wash through the, the workforce, you're going to have see quite a disruption occurring in the way traditional work structures work. So the, the whole consumerisation of the enterprise market, you know, I don't think it's that far away. And that, that's going to bring a lot of new ways of thought. You know, people are going to be more design-centred, more experience-centred in ways of thinking, but they're going to be completely disruptive to traditional IT policy. Um, so the amount of risk, even in our group, the amount of risk, you, you can see it climbing already with bringing our own devices, working you know, outside of the, the firewalls, all of these things. So um, I think the points are all valid, um, but it's going to happen. So you have to start thinking about what you're going to do about it. So what are, what are, what are you going to do? Uh, and I'm not, I'm not uh, I think that's a very good point, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't mean to, you know, throw it straight back think, to you, but to the, the panel. I though. think um, a lot of IT providers now are, are starting to provide solutions that help that. Help that. We rec have recognised BYOD for a few years now in the consumerisation of IT. So we're providing infrastructure that allows enterprises to say, that part of that device is mine, and that's where my data sits. And if, if, I, if you leave my company, I'm going to wipe it, but all, all your other data is fine. That's yours, you can do what you want with it. So I think they're enabling technologies are there around that. And then the other thing I think to Rod's point is, um, is you know, my generation are, are quite concerned about privacy and, and you know, how I expose myself on the internet or whatever. Probably that's the wrong word, actually. <laughs> I can um, assure you, we're, we're, all, we're, all, <laughs> we're all concerned here yeah, today exactly. about how you're exposed yourself. But I think, I think the, the, the point is I don't think the millennial generation are really that concerned about it. So now that may change as they get older and they become a bit more risk averse. And, um, they have a few experiences along the way, but, but generally when you look at, at what they're prepared to do and what they get worried about, they're not overly concerned about that. So I think to Rod's point, in the future, the things that we worry about today probably won't be quite the same. Mm -hmm. And there are some enabling technologies that will help companies feel safe in the meantime. Mm -hmm. There are, I think, other layers of risk uh, when we look at this as well. And, and while we don't need any major technology breakthroughs to enable the internet of everything. It's pretty clear that we don't have all of the infrastructure elements in place at this time either, at any level in fact. We certainly don't have the networks there that have the capacity and the flexibility to cope with the scale of things that we're talking about. We don't have the application and support infrastructure environment. Uh, and we don't have either the computational power or the storage capability to really handle the rich data flows that we're anticipating coming out of this. So there's an infrastructure question. There's certainly a security um, and access question, but there's also a legislative and policy environment that we need to address as well. Uh, but uh, like Rod was uh, intimating, I think we're, on not, we're underway on this journey. It's not an issue of saying, uh, listen, let's stop until we get this sorted out. There are lots of experiments and pilots and initiatives going on underway right now in New Zealand as well as around the rest of the world that are starting to explore these concepts and come up against these barriers and solve them as they go. Mm. And the weirdest device, Dave, you mentioned uh, going into a subway, a virtual supermarket shelf, and kind of, this is how I imagined it anyway, scanning the things I wanted to buy as I'm going to catch the train. Yeah. Um, what? You've all got creative imaginations. Uh, and we're an adult audience. <laughs> what, what are the weirdest things that you think? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not exposing myself in the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I've, done, I've done that game. Okay, well, what are the second <laughs> weirdest things? <laughs> There was some, uh, actually it's on the subject of user experience and there was a, uh, a show on uh, New Zealand television last night talking about the ageing population of Japan and some of the issues uh, that are facing um, middle-aged men who don't engage with women. They rather have a virtual toy. And I guess that's one area where things could get kind of creepy. <laughs> but the, 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 real, the, the real issue is actually how society creates certain attitudes within certain subcultures. Mm. And in many cases, going back to the security context, it's the enemy within is sometimes greater than the enemy without. So a lot of traditional monitoring and uh, defensive strategies that are used in this environment are all about protects yourself from the people outside. Mm. But how many people protect themselves from people within? So much fraud, so much ill intent, and you've only got to look at WikiLeaks and others to realise that it was the enemy within that was the problem. So a robust, appropriate monitoring strategy that says, watch what's going on, look for patterns that look wrong. And they're the patterns you take action on to protect yourself from a security yeah, context. That's interesting, isn't it? The security from within. We're mm. so often yeah. focused on, yeah. on outside. Rod, in terms of weird devices, uh, and perhaps, and I really did mean not the weirdest devices, but thanks very much for your... The end of limits to that is quite frightening, actually. Yeah. 
Weird, um, weird devices. What, 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 what are, using our imagination, what are the most? What are the things that today we'd have no sense might be part of the Internet of Things? And oh, look, I'm a bit of a weirdo. I don't think any devices are weird. I think anything you can dream of can basically be built over time. Yeah. I mean, if you look at even 3D printers, it's, that's the Star Trek replicator, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think you're going to see lots of interesting devices, a, a shitload of wearable tech, faster than we think. Um, I think it'll be in skin within five years. Yeah. Um, you know, so anything you can think of, they were talking about sensors, so you've got sensors, data, cloud, mobility, uh, internet, so just about anything you can dream up can happen. I mean, Google Glass, I don't think that'll be around for that long at all. That technology will be inserted into normal sunglasses and into your eyes. So, yeah. you We're already know. talking about having remote control contact lenses. That's right. I mean, they're already building um, like hip joints and stuff for 3D printers now. Mm -hmm. whole, whole industries are going to disappear. Mm -hmm. you know, why do you need to go to Briscoe's when you can build your own glasses and plates? Mm -hmm. From a complex point of view, I think the human body is going to be the most interesting thing that we connect up. Mm -hmm. Right at the moment, our people's connection to the internet is generally through a device or through an application like Facebook or something like that, but we are very rapidly getting into a world where we'll be directly connected uh, yeah. physically, and so uh, healthcare that Les touched on is a great example. We will take medicines, <laughs> um, and those medicines will actually transmit a signal to a patch on our body that will ultimately end up in the doctor's database that confirms from that we've taken the medication that we were prescribed. It will record the body's um, you know, basic reaction to that, what the vital signs were as a consequence, and, and your progress um, along as a human body. Um, from a New Zealand point of view, I think the m much more interesting thing is the impact that it's going to have on core industries like agriculture as well. In fact, right at the moment, I think New Zealand is probably at the very front of the curve uh, in being the most uh, productive agricultural nation on the earth. And the Internet of Everything and our capacity to connect up all of the animals and our pastures and our weather patterns and everything else and, and use that as a rich data source to... Um, keep ourselves at the very front of the curve is going to be one of the keys to our economic mm -hmm. success. That's bloody interesting, isn't actually, it? Actually, on that subject, there's actually some ideas and you know, dynamic ideation as we go. Imagine going from anonymised to individual in agricultural production, where you, rather than simply having beef, it's beef from a particular animal, or mm. mutton or lamb from a particular animal. You're almost going into pharmaceutical grade where you're lot tracking individual inputs in the chain. I can assure the vegetarians here, I'm also slightly freaked out by that. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. Uh, but I do remember my pet calf. I'm a farm boy, and I do remember my <laughs> finding my pet calf had met a sticky end in a ditch, uh, which I thought was quite tragic because she was beautiful. Um, uh, but I could, I, could know, I, could, I could have been getting a signal to say, you know, she's in trouble. And you could Fix post it. a vir virtual memorial <laughs> and <laughs> honour her passing. <laughs> In terms of opportunities, we've talked a little bit about risks, and I'm also I'm quite keen that we, uh, you know, this is a bit of a theoretical subject, but it's real and it's now and it's meaningful, and certainly in our planning phases here today, we in our planning phases we need to be planning. If, if, the, the audience here is core to the technology part of the information revolution. You know, these are the people with their hands on the tiller of it happening every day. Um, in terms of opportunities, we talked about the risks, what they need to be looking out for. In terms of opportunities, what can internal IT and other business functions be doing uh, to, to plan for and to acknowledge the opportunities? Perhaps, Dave, you might like to kick us off with yeah. that. One of the things which, which I certainly think out there at the moment, and Rod, you touched on it, is the consumer is now leading the enterprise. So, and the other theme which is coming through is things are changing rapidly. In fact, you look at, you know, uh, you talk about medical before, Jeff, and you know, we thought it was a neat technology when you have video conferencing in the medical field to help with an operation or give specialist care in the regions. And now we're talking about 3D printing uh, body parts and other things. Um, I suppose it's more important than, than any time actually in the future for businesses to really start listening to their customers and understanding what they see as change. Um, because, you know, there's been a number of examples in, in our time and before our time where uh, some of the best... I suppose innovations were innovations which people didn't even know that uh, we needed. And I think at the moment that's something which is happening, happening very rapidly. Things are changing rapidly. And the only way to actually get a handle on it is to see what people really want out there. Uh, because technology is not the inhibitor anymore. So there's a re responsibility, at least to themselves, for IT to actually be really hearing the market. Sure. 
to be hearing what's coming and to be at the at the front of. Um, I think David, uh, did you have a yeah, comment? just building on that a little bit. I think you know over the last I don't know five ten years, I guess the big buzzword in IT and in industry was everything was about product productivity and um, and now anything that we that we released or or made was was about improving that 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 productivity message. I think the word that, that we're all going to get fed up of hearing over the next few years is going to be agility. And, and I think uh, organizations have to evolve and, and from an IT perspective, the solutions that we're deploying, you, you can't ignore the trends that are happening. You've just got to work out how to build out an organization that's agile enough to respond to that internally and externally. Mm. So building a really agile organization is going to be key mm. from within IT, but from within the business per se? For, from every facet of the business, I think, from, from an HR perspective and how we employ people, from an IT perspective and the tools um, that we allow our employees to use, uh, right through to how marketing engines work in tra traditional ways versus non-traditional ways, and how Rod defines his products today. It's very, it has to change. It's to I see everybody agile. nodding as you're saying agility <laughs> is going to be really, really key. And I wonder if it's possible to drill down a layer, uh, uh, taking that lead, to drill down a layer to practicalities. So if that meant tomorrow I'm back in the office, or next week I'm planning for my business unit, what are some of the things, what are two or three things that the panel could suggest people might be doing to introduce agility or to introduce listening to the customer or somehow getting better access to the customer? Okay. If I can start, I mean the, the business cases that we see being built um, inside organisations that want to progress the Internet of Everything initiative are based around three or four things. Uh, the first of those is they're looking to understand how they can um, drive productivity into their organisation and expand or innovate around their business model uh, by using rich data sources, by getting better asset utilisation, uh, or expanding their product portfolio by leveraging some of the innovation that's available around the internet of everything. First case. Second case uh, is looking at the rich data streams that come out of connecting up around the Internet of Everything and uh, using that to do much stronger um, analytics and, and richer decision making uh, as a consequence of that. The third area is just connecting up the people more effectively in the organisations and giving them access to that data and that information systems. And the fourth one actually is what was touched on this morning by Jill D. McBride, if any of you were in that presentation, is just understanding how you can use the concept of the Internet of Everything to get a, a much deeper and fuller understanding of the preferences uh, and aspirations of your customer base and then connecting with those customers uh, across the multiple channels that they use to understand information flows uh, coming for you as an organisation and developing a much richer and uh, more effective customer experience as a consequence. So generally those four things are the basis of the business case. Yeah, interesting. And Les, you were about to, uh, yeah, was, to leap to answer that oh, question oh, as well. No, I'm, I'm really if glad I, though that three equals I, four in your count though. If I could just ask if we could leave the uh, 3D printing of other people's body parts out of this. No, answer. no, that's not part of my agenda. A <laughs> uh, couple of things. Um, the first one, and I'd just like to amplify what was just said, the um, connecting to your customer is very important, obviously. But beyond that, uh, going back to the point about Geraldine, the key thing is to say, how can we go beyond working out what they did to engaging with them in an authentic way. So really involve them in the ideation and the, and the co-creation process. That leads to something else that was also mentioned in the various sessions earlier today, which was partnerships. I think partnerships are important. No one organisation has all of the capacity of resources required to achieve an outcome. They have to partner, whether it be partnering with organisations like ours, some of us are competitors in different spaces, but you've got to partner. And I'll give you an example where in the healthcare context, um, we've done something like that in India, where it's a massive market, but currently an emerging and very undeveloped market. Uh, we've actually developed a product in the healthcare sector where we said, because it's not just about technology, but about a delivery of a capability, we've actually put a doctor's surgery in a box. And it's in a container, mm -hmm. and we can ship it around to poor villages. Mm -hmm. And it's got ready to go communications, IT, everything to enable the delivery of healthcare services to poor people, mm -hmm. to bring up their standard of living so that in the future they will become engaged customers and partners with us. Mm -hmm. So we're doing that in partnership with the government. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing I imagine would be really innovative in all areas of public policy to engage with industry <coughs> to bring partnerships and leverage them so that you can deliver value. Fantastic. Thanks, Liz. So as, uh, as the panel can see, the, the clock is ticking and I notice people looking down to it. I wondered. 
f from the point of view of leading teams and leading strategies and leading tactics and, and, um, and leading initiatives, two or three words that you would give leaders in the business, just two or three words, perhaps their approach, perhaps the attitude they might take, or perhaps uh, practical advice, starting with you, Rod. What are the two or three words you would share? I can't do that to that few. Um, look, the thing, I thought that stuff was all interesting around agility and productivity. The, the thing I would say, um, and that's table stakes, is think even more about where the disruption's coming from because whole value chains have been absolutely destroyed and changed overnight. You know, look what happened to print directories in, in five years. Um, so you need to actually start thinking about, and I'm sure Geraldine touched on it, um, the consumer back and, and ex the experience economy and where this is heading. Because as these millennials and that wash through, they're, they're doing things completely differently. So whole ways you do business today are, are just going to disappear overnight um, pretty much. So I'd be thinking about uh, how do you think about um, consumer design processes and the way you want to interact with your customers from the screen back, not the network forward or the platform forward. Um, you're going to have to get really good at understanding social and digital ways of communication into these, these groups as they grow and they're not just you know, the 15 to 25 year olds whole you know, generation C is doing this stuff already. Um, the guys talked about you need to connect with your market um, through non-traditional means, so you need to be you know, doing sentiment tracking back out into the, the market. Easy to do, the platforms are out there today, but it means not using traditional market research, not using traditional advertising. Um, you know, you, you design people have to have a bigger role at the, at the, at the management team. You know, design should be in front of marketing, for example. So it's quite a, quite a shift. It's quite a consumer-centric approach, but I think it will turn up in, in the enterprise. Um, it will take a while to wash through, but so you almost need to manage the business you've got today, knowing that it won't be there tomorrow. I mean, average age of some businesses now four to five years, not not seventy. Yeah. So, panel, we have run out of time, but I just wonder um, if the audience wants to grab you afterwards. If you're here, I know there's drinks later on, so uh, uh, and I know you're platinum sponsors of this event today, so there's a very good chance that you'll be here uh, shortly afterwards. ERP implementations permitting. Um, would you mind if people carry on the conversation and continue with you informally and people grab you by the scruff of the neck and ask you further questions afterwards? If not, please. we'll grab them. <laughs> You'll grab them, thank you. Everybody, please give a warm uh, vote of appreciation to the panel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard.